Live from a grungy kitchen table located in Annapolis, Maryland's scenic and historic capital, it's the Maryland Crabs Podcast. With each episode, your hosts, Tim Hamilton, John Frenet, and the occasional guest will dive in and pick apart the stuff that really matters most to you. We're too lazy to actually solve any of these problems, but we can definitely stir the pot. From schools, politics, parking in the fire lane, to those horrible people who drive BMWs. And here with this week's episode, live from the kitchen table, Tim Hamilton and John Frenet. Well, hey, we're back here with the Maryland Crabs podcast once again. Uh, This time we come from downtown at City Dock. This is John Frenet. Tim Hamilton is here with me. Uh, We have the mayor of Annapolis, Mayor Michael Panalides, who is sitting across the table from us. And we're upstairs at Middleton's. Uh, Probably not going to get a whole lot done in the podcast. We're just looking out at the view of Vigo Alley in downtown. It's just a beautiful place to be. And thank you to Jerry Hardesty and Middleton's for giving us the room to do it. It's a dismal gray day. Don't paint a... What's that? It's a dismal gray day. Don't paint a rosy picture. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. If you're just tuning in and haven't been to us before, make sure you like us uh, on Facebook. We've got the Maryland Crabs podcast, both a page and a group. You can follow us on Twitter at MD Crabs podcast. Email is info at the Maryland And there's a website that goes along with that, the Maryland But the easiest way to do this is to go on iTunes or Google Play or iHeartRadio, download it, subscribe to it, give us a five star rating and leave a comment about what you think about the podcast. We love to have information on what you want to hear about. It's all about you, about things that are important to Marylanders. And as we run into the 2017 election, and you thought we were just over it with 2016, which most of us are, Annapolis is gearing up for one because they celebrate their elections in an off year. And so as Mayor Michael Panelides, welcome. Thank you very much for taking the time. John, Tim, thanks for having me on. Big fan of the show, so I'm glad to finally be on it. So you're not mad at us for anything? Good. good. (laughs) (laughs) We'll save that for our record. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, so we're, we're three years into your term, and uh, what we do we want to look about? We've got some news. Um, there's an elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to talk about it now, or do you want to talk about it later? Whatever's best for you guys. <laughs> oh, come on. Now or later? What do you think? Let's do it. Okay. All right. All right. Annapolis Police Chief Michael Pristoop was let go yesterday. Um, and after eight, almost nine years, and we, I know last year there was a real tough time with the, with the crime. We, we talked to Chief Chris Jupe here on the podcast, and the numbers, I guess, belie the claim that crime is increasing in Annapolis. The, the numbers do, but there have been a significant number of what I would say very visible crimes, very uh, high profile, you know, the murders, the rapes, that those type of things. I mean, you know, the... Most people don't care that my bike got stolen. But <laughs> Again with a <laughs> there, freaking there, bike. There he goes with the bike. <laughs> so what was the reason? I mean, we got we got your statement. I mean, where... Was well, I, think, I think an interesting thing to point out is that we talked about in the podcast with mm. with the chief, and there wasn't a defensiveness about it, but it was it was he, he was pointing something out that we kind of agreed with, is that crime, there's a... And I think this is a national thing, that people don't feel safe, but it is safe. I mean, nationally, too, except for six cities across the country. But Annapolis, my argument has always been... And that Annapolis is is a safe place and that the murders that you have, again, when the chief said that they're targeted, I think most people misunderstood, well, you know, there's a disregard for life. And I, I, I think I understood what he was saying. But if you go to the eSport forum on Facebook, which is probably the liveliest forum, right. you know, people, even if you say, well, here are the statistics, people say, well, we don't feel safe. We feel, think it's dangerous. We hear gunshots. You live here. So I guess I see both sides. But I also understand that that there's a perception, you know, that I was saying if, if, if I kill John, which I could do very easily i'm like reach here then we have a 25 percent murder rate in this room you know and, and that's all of a sudden that's what happens with with an app well, i think too. the big thing is perception is reality so if you don't feel safe then you don't feel safe um it doesn't matter what the numbers say but you're right even if every other crime is down like a bike stolen or something else the murders bike. the ones don't that, encourage him <laughs> <laughs> murders are the ones that people care about and having a record number high murders you know we had to go in a new direction in terms of leadership vision and some new policies going forward I tell people all the time, like, what's the hardest part of being mayor? I said, it's letting people go. You know, when I came in, I had to do it. And even now, it's it's never easy, but you have to take public safety as your number one priority. And we just felt like we had to go a new direction. Well, without a doubt, I think with any business, I mean, it's, it's you know, firing somebody is, is, is difficult. I mean, you're, you're screwing with somebody's livelihood and, and, and whatnot. And hopefully they, you know, they, they can recover and move on and everybody can be in a better place. Sure. Well, I had to fire line. someone once. I was looking forward to it. I was all excited when I was getting dressed that morning. It's like the old joke. He said, what day is the best day to fire somebody? Uh, 
and most people go like, oh, Monday or Friday. And it's like, no, the day that you first think you need to, mm. um, <laughs> which is regardless of just, you know, bite, you know, rip the Band-Aid off and often do it there. So we were looking at, I was looking at the eSport Forum yesterday because that's a good way to, good place to take temperature sure. of the of the city. I mean, there's not many other places you can do that. So, I mean, of course, that's going to be an area that's relatively high crime or at least next to an area that's that's mm-hmm. uh, relative, or that has, has a higher crime rate. I didn't see a huge outcry where, where people were upset. I saw some people who were, um, who, who were mildly disappointed, but then, I saw, but then I saw people who were kind of good riddance too. But I know in the African American community, and that's very difficult to, to gauge because that is there, there's you know that's fragmented throughout the city because you're generally talking about public housing uh, when you talk about that. Um, but you know he, he was not popular with with uh, I guess would be a broad sense with the African American community, and I think that was they had that essentially the no confidence. It wasn't a vote well, of no yeah, confidence, the, but the, the African American caucus of African American leaders that. Uh, issued a vote of no confidence. I mean, and that's an organization that, um, and I don't want to, I don't want to minimize it, but I mean, it's an organization that's, it's just a group of people that have gotten together. I mean, we could be the, you know, the the caucus of two guys in jeans and one guy in a tie. Um, and well, but you know, their point is, and you got to, I mean, their point was that there, it was a culture from Baltimore, and Baltimore has been highly criticized by um, ACLU, and, and uh, even they've had an investigation by the Justice Department because of their their policing practices. And I think you know the thought was. Was that a lot of that had been imported to Annapolis? Now, I don't know if I agree, but then again, I don't tangle with the law enforcement here. So, I mean, well, we did have a, a large number of officers that had come from Baltimore mm-hmm. through the time, and I know Chief Pristoop was from Baltimore. I believe Major Baker is also from Baltimore, um, and I know there's several. I mean, I know um, Chuck Detective Bealfield is right. as well, um, and and you know they've all been longtime city officers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I just wonder if. You know, obviously, you know, you've got to change. It's an appointed position, the chief of police. Uh, it's a department director, I guess, of the, by the, the code. Is changing, you know, is, is the problem, do you think, the, and I don't want to point fingers necessarily at the chief because I think he did a fairly decent job. Uh, I think he did a very good job, but I think that, um, uh, you know, do you find, is there, a, I guess the question is, is there a culture within the police department as opposed to from the leadership that is proving to be a little bit of an issue? Well, you know, the one thing I will say is that the department overall does a very good job. And this was no reflection on them or the culture. You know, I've heard those concerns before about they came from Baltimore, they're more strong armed, so they're going to do it down here. I don't necessarily think that was the case. But I do think changing the leadership in any organization does change the culture moving down. Um, like you said earlier in the forum, some people were happy about it, some people weren't happy. But at the end of the day, a lot of people saw it coming. And now the goal is to find a new chief. So we're doing a national search right away. We're going to find somebody to come in there, try to do a bigger emphasis on community policing and also more aggressive on the heroin and the... Yeah. Well, the, heroin, the heroin, I remember when you were running for mayor th- yeah. three plus years ago. I mean, that was uh, one of your big things. You sat up there. I remember at uh, Western Annapolis Elementary School and you just said, you know, the, the drugs and also in your um, inauguration speech that it was in Maryland Hall it was, you know, no, this is going to be a... a prime focus and uh, you were pretty prescient as far as what happened. I mean, you sit there and you look at the number of deaths that are here in Annapolis and in Anne Arundel County. Uh, the statistic I've heard is that Anne Arundel County has more uh, second most deaths, heroin deaths and heroin overdoses mm-hmm. in the state behind Baltimore County and That's, Baltimore City. Yeah. Baltimore City. Uh, so the one thing I would say, it's a really a big challenge from a leadership and management point is how do you deal with it and how do you fight it? Most of the problems in the city are related to money. So for example, someone was complaining about roads. And I said, look, if you give me a hundred million dollars, I could fix every road and sidewalk in the city. Same thing with stormwater management and the environment. You need a check? <laughs> if you got one, I love it. I, that's what I lobby uh, the governor, and he's been great with the million dollars for flooding. And I enjoy that podcast right. as well. You guys had, but you know the environment and everything else. If I had a hundred million dollars, I could fix all this. We put so much money into fighting crime between hiring new officers, uh, security cameras, overtime, which have all helped, but it's still not enough. And the yeah. social aspect. I mean, I just. I mean, the, the the community policing has been a, a big topic lately, and I, and again, I think you know, I know that, the, and I'm, I'm I can't remember what the name of the spider and sting or whatever it was where they were putting people in public house officers in public mm-hmm. housing and whatnot. And I know uh, that Alderwoman Finn Lason has uh, you know said community policing forever, and and I, I've been an advocate. I was robbed twice two years ago, mm-hmm. and he took um, his bike both times. You know, to have uh, you know to have an officer that's pretty routinely in the neighborhood that I, you know, he would sort of recognize that my car belongs here, that, um, you know, makes sense to me. Um, And with 125-ish sworn positions available with probably a little bit more now with the 
1.2 million that you were able to come up with, I would think that it's probably a little bit more. You know, I, I don't, is, is there something that's not making it not easy? I know, like the school district, I sit there and say, well, it should be real easy to start school later. But they're like, oh, the buses. And, you know, so there's something that we don't, is there something that we don't know that prevents a true community police. I mean, you, you think back to Mayberry when there's a, a beat cop walking up Main Street and whistling and, you know, twirling his nightsticks, waving to all the all the shopkeepers. I don't think that's impossible. I think that would certainly go a long way, both on a, on a business end as well as on a residential end. Yeah, I think so. Um, and that's what we're working towards in the future. But for the most part, if you think about um, crime in the city, that's a lot of man hours when people are out of their cars walking around. But with the extra officers and overtime, I think we can do that because it's about building trust. Exactly mm-hmm. like you said. Like I think about myself growing up, but like I didn't know that many police officers because there wasn't crime in my neighborhood and never had to reach out. But for people that are directly affected, I mean, 80% of all of our deployments are in and around public housing. You want to know that officer. You want to have trust that you can tell them something in secret or privately and it's not going to get back to you. So building those networks and relationships are huge. Right. Yeah, I know, I know that was one big thing is to find a way that a trustworthy way to anonymously report something going on and we got a, a tips hotline we also have a website you can do it yeah you've got all that but i mean there's also you know conspiracy theorists like me and tim that would sit there and say oh yeah they're tracing ip addresses and they know exactly where it is <laughs> i mean whether whether it is or isn't is true but i mean that would go a long way i would think to anything if you could sit there and anonymously i, I can tell you they do, do not trace oh I, I'm, I'm sure i'm sure they don't but i mean somebody <laughs> now, could they i mean theoretically could the russians i'm sure somebody has the technical capabilities too but doesn't get mean putin on the line and figure it out. Well, right. I mean, you know, just the, the culture in the, in the predominantly public housing communities. I one time, uh, I'll tell tales out of school, I was probably driving when I shouldn't be, and I was coming down Compromise Street, and in that park right there at Compromise and Green Street, or uh, uh, there was two kids fighting. I had a two-by-four, was beating the hell out of the kid over the head. I stopped the car in the middle of the street, got out, ran over. What a busy um, body you are. My, my girlfriend's like, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> you know uh, the kid that was doing the beating with the, threw the stick down, started running up. I guess Newman Street, up towards St. Mary's. And I started going. There was a paramedic that was from the county that stopped, and he sort of joined. He's like, hey, what's going on? Finally got the kid, brought him down. The cops had come at the time. And kid's bloody. He's got... You know, mm-hmm. and, and I'm like, he says, okay, what's going on? What's going on? The little kid that got beat up says, like, well, we were just messing around. I'm like, messing around? You know, now this is where my alcohol was kicking in. I'm like, <laughs> messing around? No, he was beating the hell out of him. What the hell? You know, and, and the cop was like, okay, well, you get in this car. You get in this car. I said, well, you, you, you like taking him in for, and I said, no, we're going to take him home. And I was like, what? And and he, and I was just absolutely dumbfounded. And the cop explained. He said, no. He said, what's happening is if this kid says, oh, yeah, he was beating me up. There's nothing we can do because they're minors except release them to their parents. Um, and if he if he narks out on them, I said he's going to get beat up twice as bad when he gets back home, if not worse. But that's and, an example of a, of a officer who understands yeah, that's the community. And they, they understand part. the community, that's, and that that is a good example of community policing. But it's uh, you know, and I think the culture needs to change in certain areas, and and, and the respect. I think the drugs are, are as you've mentioned, you know, for years, are. Um, you know, really sort of fueling that. All right, so the so the cho- the coach is being changed. So we've replaced the coach. What you as the owner of the team, mm-hmm. where do you see? What do you want to see in a new coach? Right? What, how do you want to see the, the the culture change within the police office? The uh, within the police department. There's several things I'm looking for. One is he's got to be somebody that can inspire confidence amongst the rank and file. Because, you know, you're coming in here and elections coming up and everything else. And they're going to say, can we get behind this person? Are they going to stay? And also, are they going to value the people? You know, being a cop's a hard job. I got to tell you, talking with him, I was on the phone with some people last night. You get beat up all the time in the press, the paper. Plus, it's not easy. Like you said, you're dealing with people fighting. So someone that can show them the confidence in there, then lay them plan forward. People want to know that what they're doing is going to make a difference in what their plan is. You know, if you, I watch old films like Patton and everything. If you get behind somebody and believe in them, it's like they follow them to the end wherever they go. Well, I know that, I mean, we've got to be honest, is that, all right, so the chief was not popular within, and we're making we're painting with broad brushes, sure. you know, that, that he wasn't popular within certain elements of the African-American community, African-American leadership. Mm-hmm. And that's a complex issue uh, right right there that we can't take apart. But also, I mean, from what I understand, that among the, 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 the union itself, he was not popular as management, um, that there, there was not a lot. And, and, you know, having been in a management position, I understand that you're not going to please everybody sure. all the time, especially when you're, when you're facing uh, a union situation. You know, it may be... Uh, 
valid. There may be, uh, it may not be valid. But once that wedge is there, I don't. It's very difficult to overcome that. I mean, is that an element uh, of the confidence that that his officers had in him? Well, this was larger than one thing, so it wasn't just right. murders, or it wasn't just the union, or something else. It was accumulation of a number of things. But no, I think you bring up an interesting point about you know you can't make everyone happen, and if it's you know they always say the quarterback or the coach, but if it's the team versus the coach one of them. But the bigger one, going back to some of the African-American leadership, I don't think it's everyone. And to that point, when you talk about making them happy, you have to set up goals. Like when I worked in sales and even in life, I'll set up a goal. What's my fitness goal? What's my financial goal? What's my goals as mayor to do? And so I laid it out with them and I said, you know, here's what I've done. And so I said, half of all my officers have been diverse candidates. I had like 50% in a minimum every year and one year was 80%. And basically, I said, what number would make you happy? And their initial response from Carl Snowden and everything is like, well, you're just looking for the minimum. I'm like, no, the, the population is 25%. I'm at 50, and I've done 80 in a year right, before. Right. right? I said, what number? 90, 99, 100? And basically, what I got from him was, no matter what you do, we're not going to be happy. Well, then we want more in leadership. Well, we've promoted African-American lieutenants. We had the first Hispanic person in the fire department for lieutenant in the ranks. No matter what I do, if I hire 99%, they're going to say it wasn't 100 So I think you have to be careful when you say they're not happy because there's not a set thing they want to make them happy. Like I couldn't come to them, meaning like people could say, hey, you didn't raise my taxes. I'm happy about that. Or you lowered my trash bill. I'm happy. There's There's like no thing where I could say, or put it this way, I don't think there's anything I could do where they would come out and say, we support the mayor. I mean, do you see? I mean, I'll ask no, you no, that. no. Do I, you see whatever them coming out, Carl of the caucus saying the mayor's doing a great job and we support him? No, no, I, and I agree with you. No, saying, it's because that, you fired him, <laughs> 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 you know, right? Which was, which was which was a brilliant, actually a brilliant move. Yeah, I mean, yeah. with the way, right. I mean, that was a campaign promise that you had said that you know mm-hmm. that you did not. I remember we did the the Twitter debate and you said no, no, you wouldn't, you didn't, wouldn't support Cross Snowden on mm-hmm. Hacka. It took you a little bit. They sort of tried to work around on that, and um, well, the council yeah. tried to delay some of that, but that was interesting. I was thinking about that with you know um, the president and his. Twitter account. That was the first Twitter debate in Maryland history. Yeah, and I remember like very few people followed it, and um, I was no, telling a story was, with somebody. There was there was it was pretty big for what it was. There's a, I mean, more places than ever than than others. I think Annapolis has a really strong online community. Oh no, I do now. We, when we did the debate, and somebody was like, "But where is Twitter?" And I was like, oh, "We're doing it." Like, no, but where where is Twitter? And I'm like, "Yeah, people, probably in a California <laughs> server somewhere." So if people know? don't remember. This was uh, three years ago. Uh, John, we all talked about, it, and John put together over at um, Metropolitan, right? Yeah, that uh, Gavin gave gave us a space, and uh, we we had uh, Josh and we yeah. had Mike, yeah. and yeah, yeah. And, yeah that's a great time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling. I'm about? talking to the people who are listening right now. Yeah. No, I'm not telling him. I'm telling the listeners. Oh, okay. yeah, keep up. You want to go, go get a drink or something? Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> but, but we had an online we had an online uh, Twitter debate, so people would, would tweet in their questions, and, then, and so it was funny because we were in the room, and the room was silent as, as the two of them were typing and, and going along. And, and, and four years later, we're going to do it a little bit different. We're going to bring Twitter. We're going to bring the podcast. We're going to do a live broadcast. Yeah, that's, that's, again. So hopefully, we can count on uh, Mayor Panelides and but whoever back to, is the challenge. We'll do both. I like in. that. It, I will say it's probably the hardest debate in terms of getting everything in 140 characters. <laughs> yeah. Well, it keeps people from right. straying off uh, off point, I think. Right. It keeps, so, keeps it. All right. So back to, I mean, so we got, it's funny. So what you're kind of saying, getting getting off the police chief for a moment at least, mm-hmm. is that you're saying that uh, we had, there's always been a level of acrimony between the, the mayor and the council. And that was the, the previous mayors were all Democratic. And you still had that acrimony. And you wonder if that's part of the checks and balances, that you're going to you're gonna have that um, push and pull. And if you, you actually, you need that. Um, so to your point, were you going to make everybody happy with letting the, the, uh, the chief go? No. And, and again, going to the African-American community, and I, you always run, there's a danger in treating them and the Latinos as a monolithic community, saying mm-hmm. this is what they do with a capital T. And it's not. And, and you have people who... You know who, who call themselves African American leaders, and I'm not saying that with derision. I'm just saying because there's not an election, there's not an appointment. There's just people who say I represent the African American community. Carl Snowden would certainly be at the top of that list, at least the most recognizable one. So, do, do we know? Does he represent uh, the wishes and the desires of of the African community at large, especially those who are in public housing, or is this just an ideological position that he takes? So, whereas it, could it be that in some of these housing developments where the, they say, hey, we 
think the police do a pretty good job. And, of course, there are elements who said they wouldn't. Um, but there's no way to know that. So I it's a judgment call. I think some of the issue is that it, it goes back much further than, you know, certainly your term, but the even prior two or three mayors. And I, I find a lot of resentment from the African-American community on what we'll call the gentrification of Annapolis. And I get it. And and you, you have said, you know, a number of times that Ward 1 down here in Annapolis is this little – uh, you know, idyllic place that yeah, some committee he's pointing has invented at me, not Mike, that never really that. ever existed. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, and and I think that you're finding that. I mean, you look over in Ward well, 6. But exactly. We, I know, again, this, it's not based on race, but what I'm saying is that, that Ward 1, and I'm not picking on the people. I'm just saying, like, you know, if you look at the Historic Preservation Society, what they're preserving is something that didn't exist. It's it's an idea of what they want to exist, and public housing isn't part of that. Forest Drive is not part of that. Chinkapin Road is not part of that. What their vision of Annapolis is, and what everyone's vision of Annapolis is, is from is where right, we're right sitting right, right now, the and, the, and that's at, what people at, at think of. So, you know, when you're talking about policing, you're talking about all these things, it's always framed in terms of Ward 1, and that's that's been going on forever. But it's, I think, I mean, this area was a, was a fairly significant African-American hub East back in the Especially, and, yeah. and again, your yeah. grandparents was that that had the first the Royal Restaurant? Yep, they had the Royal Restaurant. It was the first one to desegregate in the city. Right, so where was it? A lot of ties. It was uh, right next to Ram's Head, okay. where the BB and T was. But I think you're right. There's not a monolithic community. So I saw Roxana Rodriguez, our Hispanic liaison, before I came down. You know, Larry Griffin. Everyone loves him. And you talk to people, and there's not one consensus on how they feel about it. And I think it's a mistake, like you said, to put one monolithic group. What I found interesting is when you talk door to door with people, they really appreciate it and you understand. So one example with HACA, right? We went in and did inspections on all the housing units in the city of Annapolis. That's a clap there. (laughs) And um, it was actually probably the biggest gamble I made politically as mayor because there was a lot of people, and I heard it. They were like, we heard you're coming in. You're going to throw everyone out. This is your plan to get rid of public housing in the city. I said, first of all, that's not the case. I'm doing it for the opposite reason. I care, and I want to make your life better. So we went in there. I knocked on people's doors, and they said, yeah, my shower's been leaking for three months, or my dishwasher doesn't work, or this light's hanging down. And they appreciated us coming in there and following up with them. Right. And the other thing, too, if you get into the race, think about it. Would we have ever let any other part of the city get as bad as that? No, and I always and I've said that many times. Like it, it's, for example, and John and I have disagreed about this, but this was a couple years ago when the police were uh, there was there was some sort of robbery with some some um, black youths or it was something relatively minor, and they were taking pictures over Harbor House or no, actually it was over on uh, Clay Street. Clay kids. Street. Oh, yeah. So they're pulling the, the kids the, out and they're taking the, the picture. Top of Main Street, and it was kids. And John's argument at the time goes, well, they don't have a, they don't have a expectation of privacy because they're in public. I'm saying, well, wait a minute. These are police who are pulling the kids aside to take their pictures, which is different than taking pictures of kids as they're walking by. And my test is, if you did this over at St. Mary's, if you're pulling kids as they're walking out of St. Mary's and the police are saying, I'm going to take your picture, the parents would have gone batshit. And and I feel that way for Ward 1 as well, is that some of the things that would, ha- would happen in public housing, like you said, if any of those things were happening anywhere else, it, 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 it it's tolerated there, but if it, it, it wouldn't be tolerated here. So I, 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 think I will that's say the parents did go crazy because they came to a city council meeting and called and, me at 10 o'clock at night. But you're right, not the same level of outrage right. that they had. So, all right, so going back to, to the police, so yeah, sure. specifically, so we've got an issue. We've had, how many, 12 last year? We were up to three this year? It was two ten. this year. Ten, ten last year, two, ten, 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 ten two this all right. year. Yep. So, Both of which have been closed, I believe, right? Yeah, we are success no. rate is much higher than everything else. Yeah, the issue I, is you got to prevent it before it even right, happens. Right, right. I mean, it doesn't doesn't do any difference that it's it didn't doesn't stop anybody from getting killed. But mm-hmm. um, I mean, the police are, are investigating that. But what, one of the questions I guess I have is that um, where are you looking to draw your I, I know you say a nationwide search. I know when um, David Gerald came in from mm-hmm. uh, Public Works, he was from San Diego, I believe, yep. which is a huge city compared to what Annapolis is. Mm-hmm. Um, where are I mean, are you looking for a specific size city that you would look to draw a police chief from? Well, I think that's more about the person, but we have done national. We had Mike Morris, the Rec and Parks director, was from Texas. Okay. He was one of the best. Um, the city attorney was locally, so it's about finding the right person, not necessarily where they're from. You know, off the top of my head, I don't think we would... Well, first of all, let me talk about the process. They do a nationwide search for every department head. Then what happens is they have... Who, who, who does the search? Because uh, uh, HR, so they advertise in magazines. 
Then they have a committee of about eight to ten people, usually specialized in a field, like for the harbor master, Beth. And they'll narrow it down to the top three. And then the city manager and I interview the top three, and we present one to council. Okay. Here, I, can I give you a, a suggestion? Sure. On the police. So now, we were talking about this at, at, over a hot dog earlier. You need to find down, this brilliant or be really ticked off he's Pips bringing this up. Okay. This was, it's, it's got some risks, but it's, it's, it's got some potentials there. But you're, you're going into an election, and, and you are in somewhat of an anomaly in a, a Republican mayor in a predominantly democratic type of a city. Sure. There wasn't a landslide election that, that won you in there. You've done an, an admirable job. I don't think anybody can fault you for the job that you've done. No, I mean, I, I mean, I think that's fair. Um, but you do have two candidates at this point running against you, one of which will succeed. Who are very different from each other, other than right. the same party. They're diametrically and opposed. Would it make sense? I mean, you, you made changes when you came in. You were sweeping Annapolis clean uh, off of your campaign. And, and undoubtedly a new if you were to lose a new administration, would want to make some changes on their own, which makes it real risky for me as a police chief. Mm-hmm. You know, hey, am I looking for an 11 month or a nine month job, I guess, at this point? What about talking to Senator Astell and Gavin Buckley, bringing them in on a search committee and say, OK, well, this is and, and you know, working out some sort of an agreement that, OK, where the cards fall, where they may come November 7th, whatever the, you know, whatever the date is, that we are, you know, we're behind this candidate. I mean, I think that might bring a stronger candidate out. This might bring somebody from a San Diego, from a uh, Oakland or something along those lines that may want to do it. Well, now, and this is where we're, there were candidate panelides and mayor panelides clash, because <laughs> if I'm your if I am your campaign manager and because he was telling me this as we were eating at Pips, which is awesome, by the way. Uh, I don't know if I'm your campaign manager. I don't know. It's either brilliant or it's got a high risk to it. So I don't know. I, I, I'd like to say that I have an opinion on that. What he says has merit, but as from, but also, you know, you, you, the whole point of having uh, different candidates is because you have a different concept of what you want to bring to the table. So is your idea of what you want to see out of the police different than, say, Senator Astle's or, or Gavin's? You know, yeah, that's the whole reason they're running is because they think that they can do something they bring up to the table that, that's not there already. Although I think if you look at it, um, when I came into office, I did make a number of changes at the department level, but I kept the majority of our department heads. So in public taking care of that public information officer, though. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah she's got, trouble. Stuck, she's got, got a problem. For, <laughs> you're saying that because Rod is right next to me in the corner. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> um, she's clearly giving me sign language. Yeah. Um, when you find well, good with people, one finger hands. <laughs> I, she didn't. Now she just glared at me. <laughs> when you find good people, they survive throughout administration. So if you look at Chief Priestu, he was there from Warrior Cohen and myself. We needed to change with what happened. Uh, Chief Stokes had been there through multiple administrations. Right. Most of them had. So I think if you find the right person, they're going to survive throughout administrations. David Gerald is another good one. But when you look at it, I think the concern would be it's hard enough to get a confirmation through the city council as it is. Getting it through the other two candidates would be a little tough. Okay, that's but, fair. No, I understand the question you're saying, but you know, you're going to find someone, probably find somebody who's um, ambitious, looking to move up the chain and take the risk. You know, you admire that in someone or someone who's retired and maybe doesn't need the job but wants to do it to give back. So, right. well, but it's also we're, we're the state capital, so this is a great job to have, and it pays over 150 a year. So, it's not the the worst gig, even if it is for nine months. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Hey, it only pays a little bit better than being the city attorney that gets a 20 some odd thousand dollar raise for a six month. Yeah, it pays a lot better than uh, podcasting. But, um, before we fish out the, the police thing, I mean, what's your what's your timetable on, on this? When do you, I mean, in, in an ideal circumstance, yeah. you, you've you got somebody that is willing to take a risk on on the rest of your term and continue yeah. on to a second term. What's your, I mean, when would you ideally like to see a new chief of police rolling into Taylor Avenue? So I'll give you a specific number, but the overall answer is as soon as possible. So we're doing a nationwide search. I think by law we have to keep it open for 30 days once you get those candidates i'll have the search committee go through and i'd say i'd give them less than 30 days to go through so 60 to 75 days to have a new person in place wow. do you have any do you have any idea of how competitive a police chief is nationwide i mean uh, you know I, I mean if you get a pool of 10 people are you know are we now concerned that our top three picks may be looking at kansas city and Buffalo or potentially, I mean, every department head. We get a lot of the people that apply. Like for planning, I think we had forty or fifty, but it's a big draw, and it's not always necessarily a chief coming. You could find someone at the lieutenant major level that's looking for you know, a larger market. Sure. Yeah, larger market, sure, sure, interesting. But yeah, there's going to be a lot of the people that apply, a lot of top talent that come forward because it's a dream job for a lot of people. Right, right, absolutely. Is it a dream job for you? 
To what, be police chief? No, mayor. No, no mayor. Of course it's a dream job. I mean, look, I grew up here. I wanted to run for, you know, the last eight years. I did it. I was fortunate enough people took a chance on me, and I think I've job that done well. So I love people. I love being mayor. I, that's why I do it 60 hours a week. You know, when you're doing something you love, as grueling as it can be, and council meetings are, it's... And to your credit, and we'll say this, we said it in the previous podcast, you did blindside everyone. And granted, it was a perfect storm. There's sure. a lot of stuff going on, a lot of moving parts. But we always said you were doing the door-to-door knocking, and you, were, you, know, you couldn't take away from that. So it was, it was, it's not an easy feat to be a young as young as you were, a Republican in, in a town like this. So Yeah, I mean, I had managed campaigns. I grew up in politics. I was involved. But, you know, I laid out a five-year plan between being president of the community association, on the neighborhood watch, nonprofit boards, and said, what is it going to take me? And I actually wanted to run seven years ago, and they were like, don't run. You're going to lose. You're too young. So I managed Dave Portal's race. Right. Came about 300 votes shy. So right. I was like, look, I know what it is. Raising doors, or raising doors, yeah. knocking on doors, raising money, having a message and just consistently doing it day after day. So what took, you, what, persistent. what took you by surprise with a job? I mean, just from a very practical, low end. Yeah. Like, I've had, I've taken jobs before where I come in and I'm looking at the big picture and there's little things I'm like, I didn't, didn't consider this. I didn't think. Um, I think the first one, and it's probably most politicians' frustration is how long it takes to get things done. So where I came before, you know, your boss is, do it by Friday, you don't show up Monday. <laughs> and here in government, they're like, well, no, it's got to go to committee, and then it's right. got to go to this committee, and then rules, and then someone else has got to opine on it. Then you got to have 45 days notice. So everything you do takes forever to get done in government. That was probably the biggest challenge. I think you're, I think you're finding that's what our president is finding out as well. Mm-hmm. well that's what I, found. I told you on our community association, since we live in an area with just so much governmental uh, um, influence, you know, I was on the board of just a POA, and you know, half the people who work there are federal employees or or, um, or county employees, and they're all great people. They're good at what they do, but when it came to any sort of uh, um, expediency on anything, like you know, I think I told the story before. We we were had, we wanted to have we had the money put aside to have a playground done, and we're like, let's build a playground, and they're like, no, whoa, oh, whoa, yeah. let's slow it down. Committee, committee, and, committee. and, and three years agree. later, I'm like, where the, <laughs> where the hell are we on this playground? This is we've had the money for three years, you know, but to them that was it was cultural. Yeah. So so your clash seemed to be a lot of it was cultural and you had a pretty steep learning curve because you went I mean you, it's not even like you were a councilman it wasn't that you know, I mean yeah, you're you came, mayor you came, I, you came in fresh with uh, you know without any I mean obviously you knew a little bit about what, what the situation was but I mean it wasn't you I mean know, you I mean, had Josh, Josh Cohen was you know ordained into that into that position vis-a-vis sure. Ellen Moyer yeah, but I said this town. too you're yeah. the you're the mayor of the capital of the wealthiest state in the most powerful country in history. The night you were elected, you had that exhilaration, and then at midnight, you had to be going, oh, shit. I don't believe this just happened. <laughs> now, well, I gotta be honest with you, I wouldn't yeah. be What was the word more. of the night? Now what? <laughs> <laughs> no, look, I, I love the job, and um, you know, I had been involved in politics um, a lot before, you know, clubs and campaigns and everything else, and knew it. Um, I did political advertising at the Baltimore Sun, and even at Vocus, I sold political action software and one of the things we did which was actually funny is we sold grassroots advocacy software so you know fill out this form and contact your elected officials and so now like I was selling that to groups and then I have it done to me and I'm like ah, I have to call my old boss up and I'm like man it's like irony is pretty sweet yeah, it's, it's all coming true. back to bite me that's true well I'll, t- I'll tell you what before um, we've sort of fished out the, the police pond and I, I, yeah. I'm glad to see that you know we're, we're on top pond. of it we've got something you know down the road um Take a little bit of a break, get a refill on my water, pay some bills. Blow your nose. And um, when we come back, we'll talk about uh, some of the successes you've seen in the past three years, some of the challenges you see in the next year, some of the challenges that you've seen going forward or that actually have been throughout the whole years. All right. Go blow your nose. When a ring from the United States Naval Academy comes into Zachary's for a center stone, it always makes us wonder. Where's this one going? Where's this one been? A nuclear sub in the North Atlantic? A carrier deck in the South Pacific? The moon? 52 astronauts are Academy graduates. From Iwo Jima to Okinawa. Corregidor to the Coral Sea. Midway to the Persian Gulf. Congress to the White House. These rings go where America goes. 73 that went to war were awarded the Medal of Honor. But wherever they go, wherever they may serve, our admiration goes with them. Zachary's. Online at Zachary'sJewelers.com. More than a jewelry store, a jeweler. 
If you don't like huge draft beer selections, don't go to Union Jacks. If you're not looking for an incredible menu and dozens of screens to catch your favorite teams, I repeat, do not go to Union Jacks. Not into darts and pool? Good. Live music not your thing? Perfect. Bottom line, if you are not interested in the best dining and bar experience in Annapolis, avoid Union Jacks. But if this all sounds totally friggin' awesome to you, visit Union Jacks in Annapolis, just across from Whole Foods in the Annapolis Town Center. Union Jacks, not your old-style pub. In 2015, Anne Arundel Medical Center had to transfer more than 1,100 mental health patients to a mental health facility outside of this area for care because the facilities they needed do not exist in our own community. These patients and families are our friends, loved ones, and co-workers, and they deserve better. Join Anne Arundel Medical Center and presenting sponsor m and Bank on Saturday, April 29th in Annapolis at AAMC's Denim and Diamonds Bash. Denim and Diamonds is a wonderful evening under the stars, featuring fabulous cuisine, gourmet food trucks, silent auction and dancing, all to support expanding mental health care in our community. It's an evening of great fun, but it's not just a party. For tickets and sponsorship, visit aamcdenimanddiamonds.org. And we're back. John's hydrated? A little bit. Yep. Stuffed up nose and everything. That's okay. And how, how's your tea situation there, Mr. Mayor? It's doing well. All right. <laughs> okay, so we're all good. So... Again, we're in election year, so this is where everyone kind of, uh, it's kind of like performance review, and everyone starts scrutinizing everything. Mm -hmm. So one of our favorite topics, one that we fished uh, out a lot, where people roll their eyes, which is um, a business, Annapolis, doing business in Annapolis. And again, this my pet peeve is that whenever we talk about business in Annapolis, we're talking about Main Street, we're talking about downtown. So for people who don't know, we had a great talk uh, God, a few months ago with uh, Sean O'Neill, who was the former president of the Annapolis Business Association, and he was also instrumental in uh, combining that with the um, uh, downtown, downtown Annapolis partnership. Downtown Annapolis. Can I go off on that for a second? Please do. Okay. The downtown Annapolis part. This is this disclaimer. This is my opinion. Um, but the downtown Annapolis partnership uh, is a is a good organization there. But they're too focused on by their contract downtown. And I think when Sean O'Neill orchestrated the sale merger, whatever you want to call it, of the Annapolis. Uh, Annapolis, what was the case called? ABPA, Annapolis Business, ABA, Annapolis Business Association to whatever, and it changed its name a couple times. I really think that the the soul of the business community was sold to the city. Um, Inadvertently, I, and I, I will say that too, because it was, it, was, it was, I think it was envisioned to be something more than it was. Um, and I, you know, I was you and I, and especially I was a huge critic of the AEDC. I thought I don't think public-private mm-hmm. partnerships work, especially in business. Mm-hmm. I think the Republican would probably say that that you know government should stay out of, out of business. Um, and I, I was very critical, and I disagree with with uh, Alderwoman Finlayson on on many many things. However, mm-hmm. she was right when she put the blame. She said, as a council, it's our fault because we did not give them a goal and a vision for what what to do. And and she was right. And I think that was the sort of thing is that. It was go improve business, and they were left to their own devices. And you know, so th- well, I, my my thought is just the city with the the way it's structured now. The city seems to have so much oversight of the business organization. You you look. I, I remember when the, the original executive director Lisa Thompson uh, had left. I had seen a copy of some emails where she had to talk to Pete Gutwald and planning and zoning to get permission to make twenty five color copies to do this, and it was denied. Uh, and I remember that. When she left, they were told, don't hire anybody until we let you know which direction we want to go, which to me really says that the city had you know, their thumb on their pulse and they were controlling the pulse of the business community, which I think the business community needs to be vibrant. I've often said that I, I would love to see a non-voting business seat on council. I'd love to see that. Um, to have you – know, just to have them heard. I mean, I get that I, they, don't, they don't pay residential taxes and, and whatnot, but uh, I think – to have a, vibrant, taxes, though. a vibrant community, a business community, is, is critical. And, and one thing that you've said a lot of times is, is that, as a city, and I'm not saying this is you particular, um, but you're that, saying you and pointing at everybody. It 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 doesn't matter whether a store is vacant or occupied. You get the check. It you get the check when the property taxes come in. You're not getting a slice of sales tax. You're not getting, uh, you're getting a small slice of hotel taxes and some amusement taxes for certain businesses that do that. But overall, it's property taxes that make the city run and fees. 
Oh, can I say one thing about that that's interesting? And then we'll let the mayor uh-huh. talk. Get a word in there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I lived in it's Albu- my platform, Dan. Yeah. I lived in Albuquerque for a while, and it was interesting, which is a very liberal city for the most part. Mm-hmm. And But they have the power to enact sales tax there. Mm-hmm. So what they would do is that if they want to build a new art center, they put like a quarter percent sales tax. And if they want something else, they put like a, like a you know, a 50, point, a half percent sale. Well, I was reading, and this, this was 20 years ago, I was reading something recently that the, the taxes in Annapolis are so out of hand because over years they just keep slapping those taxes on so i always thought it'd be a great idea and i think you can't do it by state charter if if you know if, if the municipalities could could have a piece that's the of McDonald's the sales tax. principle you raise the price of french fries by two cents and you you know you, you get yeah three, but three million dollars a day yeah but when you put it put it on everything and so right now it's it's really biting them in the ass because all of a sudden their their sales tax is like 14 15 percent right uh and the, but but they, they get revenue from it but that's that's an issue so i serve on the Maryland Municipal League, we're basically representing all 157 cities in Maryland. And we're always lobbying for ways to get city more money and everything, because we're at the hands of the state and the county a lot of times. You know, I don't support the city raising the sales tax at all, but it's an interesting kind of philosophy or pitch to get more money for the city, because you're right. We but don't we can't, get those I, revenues. I, I, I was talking to Jared Lippman about that, and he, yeah. he goes, let me cut you off right there. You yeah. can't do it because of the, the state chart. I'm like, oh, I didn't know. I thought it was brilliant. I'm like, I've solved everything. No. <laughs> Dealing with <laughs> a bureaucracy at a whole nother level. Well, speak Let's go back to bureaucracy. So yeah. that has been the, the, the chief criticism for as long as I can remember. Oh, so this I, is, I agree with that. So how, how you know how do we how do we cut through it? Because I talk to every business owner. I make it a point to talk to every business owner open. Say how was it the experience? It's never a good experience ever. And and it, it's and that I think it's become to the, the forefront when you look at the Trump administration when he's the first one to look at the. And I'm not a fan, but I mean he's looking at the bureaucrats and saying there's a problem with the with the people who are embedded in in these bureaucratic positions. It doesn't matter what happens with the administration. Right. They're they're the pro- he says they're the problem. I don't know if I agree or not, but but is that an issue here where you have to to, to cut through the red tape and it's significant? You know, does someone have to come in at some point to say we got to stop this? You know, the, the, well, the- I think we have, and I think it's already started. So if you look at it, when I came in, it was one of the first decisions I changed was the planning director, and I thought you know Annapolis had this bad reputation. We had to go in a new direction. And I think one of the first things we saw is we had to reorganize government. There was planning and zoning, then there was the Department of Neighborhood and Environmental Programs, which, by the way, doesn't exist in any other of the 157 cities, duplicating a lot of jobs. That's all merged, and the reorganization has made it better. Is it great? No. It's not great, but we are taking steps in the right direction. And I think there are businesses, if you talk to the Iron Rooster about their opening expansion, if you talk to um, Criswell Automotive going out there, there's a number of businesses that have had good experiences, and the new director's making a lot of those changes. It's just been been fighting to get a permit for, I mean, they've been, it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. I was talking to Kyle not too long ago, and it was like, well, we're hoping April, we're hoping April. But I think some of that might be a sort of preservation, not the city. So if they've called okay. me for anything, I'd be okay. good. Well, I think, I think and, and this is, for, for me, for example, we brought this up before. We know somebody, I don't want to bring him up because he's terrified of being targeted. I mean, I'm not saying he would be, but, you know, he, he had a marquee for a sign, and it was, uh, he changed the name of the business. All he had to do was change literally the paper inside the business, and it was like a twenty-five hundred dollar fee to do that because he had to re he had to relicense the, or uh, repermit the sign and everything. And he was banging his head, and he you know he wanted to change out uh, a piece of equipment, and he had to get architectural drawings, and that cost him five grand something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was it was, oh, and it was for, dull was like over ten thousand. Yeah, so so if you're a small business fan, name as opposed to, to George Criswell, you know, I'm not saying he got preferential treatment, but you know he's going to be much larger, and that's going to be much more. Um, uh, the, the optics on that are, are much more favorable than some some small guy who's got a restaurant. That's the the red tape that I think that that still re- kind of remains. And again, that's been going on for a long time. And I don't think that's an administrative uh, from the administ- administration's fault. It's just it's, I've seen some of the same people in city government who've been there forever, as long as I can remember. They don't they don't change with the, the administrations. Um, yeah, there's there's very few um, political positions within there. But I always say it's about two things: people and process. So we have a lot of good people that work there, but they got to bad process. If the rules are rules, I have to go through it. And I'm trying to change some of those rules. And I think we've done it. So one is I passed a law um, with the council support. If you're doing something under $500, you don't need a permit. Because I went in there exactly what you're saying. This is crazy. Replace one window for 100 bucks. You need a permit. You're bogging everyone else down and you're holding up the real projects that need to go. So getting rid of a regulation like that, reorganizing the government, and then explaining to people, you know, you don't need to be so hard on everybody all the time. I think the downtown area, because they want to keep it historic, 
is a little bit different than the rest of the city. But I think there have been a number of, you know, there's been 364 new or expanded businesses in the city since I've been in office. I mean, you think about the downtown right. area. Well, I know, I know. Do you know Mike Carter? He, he does the uh, ghost tours, and I think he consulted with the city at some point and he, when the market house, when uh, at, at some iteration of the market yeah. house. Um, and, and he said, he had a really good comment to me one time. He said that uh, the city is stuck in a culture, and, and this is going back, not necessarily reflective of your term, but going is stuck in a culture of no, because you've got so many employees that have been there so long, and this is the way it's always been done, and it's a very easy way out, yeah. as opposed to giving the employees uh, the ability to think out of the box and just sit there and say, well, yes, let me try to do this and see if we can do that. Um, and I think that, that that would go a long way. I, I, I don't know if the city has the means or the ability to you know, sort of secret shop the process, uh, you know, tag along with an architect or with a developer to see what's, you know, what's going on. I think that would be a fascinating study to say, you know, uh, I think you, you mentioned Chriswell Audi, and I think that was probably a little bit easier of a project, A, because he's got the money. He's got Audi that's giving him, I'm sure, some financing. And it was a big vacant lot, uh, and you started from scratch as opposed to Iron Rooster here who took over Pink Crab, I think it was. Right, it's not in the, in the historic district. Which and is they, they've, got to, they've got to breach yeah. walls and make sure and it's all shored up and everything else. So I think there's some differences there. Uh, but it'd be fascinating, I think, to see if the city could shop themselves. And, and I mean, yeah. people do that all the time. I mean, you know, you've got a business. You send but I will call. tell you, believe me, my phone and emails get um, nonstop calls about people that are having problems. And I was with the planning director the other day and the city manager and said, here's three people that called and complained. I need you to fix it. But the one thing I do want to highlight on a segue a little bit is things are getting done. And we were thinking about it, and I said, that's one of the things I'm most proud of is that even if you don't agree with what's happening, the fact that we're doing things. Because so often in Washington and everywhere else, things just stall forever. So if we look out the window here, you know, 110 Compromise Street. I was with John Bruno and Mike Keenan the other day. We were down at Pusser's. That's now open. It's going to be a Boston Whaler dealership going in there. And that's been 10 years in the making. 10 that's years, right. So 10 years vacant, it's under there. And the work that went into it, I'm, I'm doing a column in the Capitol on it, and I was trying to calculate how many emails, how many Ward 1 meetings, how many public hearings. And it's almost impossible to calculate how much time went into it. But the highlight of that is you have to do things the right way. So if you look at that, basically, you know, when I came into office, I was like, look, I'm not going to let this plan go through. I'm going to stop it, right? And the day I got elected, I think Mark Rodan... That was, that was, that was something about saving Annapolis, right? Yes. <laughs> they, they, they did the yeoman's work on that. But uh, no, as a candidate, I said, look, I'm, I'm going to stop it. And I did. They pulled out the day I got elected. But we worked with people. Because remember the what was happening? It went through three variations. Originally, it was, well, the city should eminent domain it and take over. First of all, I'm diametrically opposed to that. I mean, that's just a bad philosophy in government to do unless you absolutely need to. Second one was, well, you know what? Let's buy it for $5 million. By the way, it sold for 4.5. And then we'll take it, tear it down, sell it to, not tear it down, fix it up, sell it to somebody else. And the third one was in spot zoning. We'll make it C2 commercial zoning. And I said, no, we can preserve the maritime industry. How are we going to ever get a maritime tenant? Uh, Boston Whaler dealership in North Salem, you can't get more maritime. Right. And yes, they want to put in a restaurant, but I think it's going to be a world-class facility. Because when you think about dining outside, the only places you can eat are almost all private. Annapolis Yacht Club, East Fort Yacht Club, uh, Fleet oh, Reserve. Pus Pus Pusters. Pusters. Yeah, Pusters in uh, Carroll's Creek, pretty much, I think. Yeah, but on the Annapolis side. Right. Right. But I'm in for like a fine dining, like upscale experience. Right. So I think it's going to work out well. But, you know, we got that done. The Stevens building. I mean, how long was that vacant for? Mm. The pocket park that burned down. I was just sitting there forever. That's right. done. So we've done things. It was where we 2004, fixed. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It was 10 years ago, mm -hmm. less than 15, no. 15, 10 years ago, 15, last year. 15 was uh, his, the 10 year anniversary of the fire. Yeah. So if you think about it, these things have been around almost all of them for a decade, and they're finally getting done. I take the bulkhead, you know. I never should have done that bulkhead. The reason is it should have been done a decade ago. But we had photos showing there's no concrete, just rebar hanging down. We built it on schedule and a million dollars under budget. I think that right. goes to the management. Well, so that was that was that was that was done before. I mean, that was executed under you, but it yes. was. I mean, it was already. Right. Uh, I say, you know, planned to be to be done under the under a prior administration. What's happening? What's happening with the faucet building? It, it's going to be really weird. Whatever goes in there is like the the the. 
uh, earmark of the building mm-hmm. to call it not faucets. <laughs> you know? right. um, I think mean, faucets got to love all this free publicity yeah. they've been getting. Well, I think what's happened is we're getting rid of these businesses and just keeping the names. The Stevens sign yeah. is still up. Right. You know, that's yeah. the mission. Now, that was actually really cool, though. That I was. Think. You, it is an honor for the family. I, think, yeah. I thought that was really cool. Do you know what's going in? I mean, you've talked about a restaurant. Is there, Do they have a lease on that restaurant, do you know? Uh, no, and they're actually still taking applications. Like we're, tr- we're looking for people right now, but, you know, the Boston Whaler dealership, North Sale, um, and I think they're so they can take over a, a third of it or half yeah. of it and let it. They're probably looking for other tenants too. Right. Okay. What are we going to do with Market House? You know, I'm actually uh, when I read that article in the paper, that's the hard thing is I've never gone up and said I'm going to sell the Market House. Now I've said a lot of other things, the old rec center, the golf course. I've done that, but I never said it's my position as mayor to sell the Market House. I am so sick of the Market House. I would just want to wipe it off the face of them. I'm so sick of talking but about. But you know it. what? After this, we should go down there and get something. Because here's what I tell people when I speak. I say, look, I go there a lot. Yeah, everybody's talking about it. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. I said, if you look at it, there's fried chicken, and it's the same fried chicken that used to be there because Harvey Brownder brought the guy back. You've got fresh oysters there. You know, you've got smoothies, everything else. I encourage people to go down there. And looking at it, I said, about it, I said, it's been open every day since I've been mayor. And not to go back and relive the history because I don't want to do all that, but it was closed for nine years and cost the city six million dollars. Well, and you you inherited a mess. Josh inherited a mess. Oh, uh, you know, and and so that le- I, and the Moyer administration. I I'm just it, that was their fault, and and it, you can't you can't parse it. You can't you. It, it was it was a debacle, and that to me represented everything wrong with city government is what happened to the market house, and it was and no one ever took responsibility for it. So I, I was reading the Capitol yesterday, and I was engaging in my worst habit, which is reading the comments, and. Um, uh, there was someone there who was highly critical. He, it's um, he, he he's uh, he's extremely Republican. So he was saying you inherited a mess when he's not lying. We're talking and, to you, Bob McWilliams. Yeah, and he was laying the he was laying laying the blame on the feet of um, Josh and and uh, Ellen. And I just don't think I don't think that's fair to Josh, frankly, because he inherited an absolute disaster too. You know, and I think can it be saved? You know, and I, I don't know if it can be. And now, yeah. like you said, I go there now, and they had the best pizza. They had the best pizza in town, and then they took the pizza guy who worked there and they moved him somewhere else. And now the pizza's not as good. They got to work on that. <laughs> Harry's got Harvey's got to work on that. Well, but. We'll go back over there and we'll bring it up to him. But no, well, yeah, think, you're the mayor. Make it happen. Just, just <laughs> say you over here. Make him a pizza. <laughs> a pizza. But look, I think if you go back and think about it, it's been open every day and it's making the city money. So it has turned around, and I think that's a highlight of how we've managed it. Um, well, but know. it is making. You said it is making the city money now. I and I my my I can't be using alternative facts. Um, <laughs> I thought the the original lease had something that the market house needed to make three hundred thousand profit. Before rent was due to the city, or and and that three hundred thousand may not be. Is that, or it could have been renegotiated? Is that, or is that my imagination? So I, I'm not sure. I have to look. But all I do know is I show the expense and the revenue account, and then we get the money coming in every year, the profit we make. So you add in the cost of all right. They do Wi-Fi, their water bill, their electricity bill. What does it cost to run it versus what's the revenue? And we make money every okay. Year. Okay, and, and, you've, and you've switched it yeah. from an enterprise fund. Into yeah, and, a, you know, they try to knock us a little bit on that, but I said, you got to think about the depreciation on it, right? I don't, yeah, explain, yeah, so I don't understand the enterprise fund versus general fund. So, basically, an enterprise fund has to be self-sufficient. So, water bills, sewer bills, things like that. Which weren't. And you, Which weren't. I mean, you were forced to raise raise some of the trash bills and the water bills. Not trash, um, water we lowered the trash bill 30%. The yeah. water bill, we'll get back to it in a second um, <laughs> on that one. But... When you go into it and you look at it, basically, what does it cost to operate a, a water treatment plant or sewage or the dock? And then that has to pay the same. Otherwise, the government, the transportation, we subsidize transportation. So the market fund, that building was getting knocked for costs no other building did. So there's police station, fire station, public works, main city hall, transportation, rec and parks. There's a city has a cleaning contract. People clean. They're like, well, the market house has to pay for their own or they have to pay for their own lights. And so they were eating all these costs that no other city building had to. But on top of that, if you're going to come up with the premise that says, all right, this six million you lost, whether it was buying three air conditioners, the 12 grand a month from going to market, the 2.5 million lease, you're never going to get out of that hole. I said, I could double, triple, quadruple the rent. I'm never going to get out of that six million. So in that sense, are you ever going to eat all the depreciation money you lost? The city could never charge right. enough to eat that up. Okay. But in the sense of, are you making more money than you're spending? Yes, we are. Um, and we're, we're we're coming up close to an hour. What's your? All right, let's let's talk about where. Here you are. You're toward the end of your first term. Mm-hmm. 
what what are you most proud of? What what is what is the shining moment for Mike Mayor Mike Panelides in in the city that you've done? Keeping in mind that we're going to ask what the <laughs> what the opposite question might be, <laughs> right? Right afterwards. My, uh, my, I'm just my downside is I'm just too successful. I care too much. <laughs> we're going to be tired of winning, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think what I'm most proud of is I've been able to accomplish my goals, and that's really the reason for the second term is building. So, number one, financially, looking back when I came into office, you were talking about earlier. You know, it wasn't all glitz and glamour. They're like, you have a seven and a half million dollar hole. You have to get out of it. I passed three budgets in the city of Annapolis without raising the property tax rate. We lowered people's trash bills 30%. And on top of that, it's not just me saying we have a good record. The bond rating agencies that let us borrow money both have upgraded our credit rating. So we've had a good financial sense. The other thing I think we've done is we've passed historic and landmark legislation to stop overdevelopment. So I'll look at the adequate public facilities, the Forest Conservation Act. Those are all legacy things that you know, started under probably the Moore administration for a decade that we finally saw completed. And we talk about adequate public facilities, you know, it was the Wild West in Annapolis. You could build whatever you want, whenever you wanted. It doesn't matter if Tyler Heights is 140 percent over capacity. So we put rules in place to stop parts of the city from being ever developed. And other than that, you know, there's I, I could go on and on forever, but I highlight the partnerships we've done with people. I think if you look at my partnerships with County Executive Shu, you know, some of them have been great. Uh, you look at yeah. look at economic development. I mean, you've got mm-hmm. Hollis Minor, which you're splitting some costs there yep, that, yep. That, that she's doing there. You've got uh, any, any number of them. Are, are you are you exploring additional ones? All the time. We have partnerships. Police with fire. Uh, no, I'll say no. no. <laughs> that comes up every year, and like the, the political storm of that would be way too much. And plus, right. it's it's also nice for Annapolis to have its own police and fire department. Okay, so that might be the end of the second term. Uh, <laughs> 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 no, that's a, you know, there, there's certain fights you don't try to get into where people are like selling the market house. I said, I, I got a hundred right. other things on my plate right now I'm trying to get through. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, some, some of the, the cooperation between the county and the city has been very, mm-hmm. very encouraging. Yeah. Um, and certainly I think you've got a, a perfect storm as far as cooperation go with a Republican governor mm-hmm. uh, that lives in the county, mm-hmm. that lives, you know, actually he sold his house, but he died. He's got a place down here too. Yeah. He's got public housing in the city, city of Annapolis. Oh, you're talking about the governor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, the governor uh, Hogan's been fantastic. I mean, when I reached out to him, you know, I've been trying to do big legacy projects. When we talked about the bulkhead and everything else, I think the two things that I want to leave is one, the work we're doing on flooding, and the other one's public housing. Because I think that's going to last without. You know, a new mayor can come in, can raise and lower water bills, change the budget. But the work we're doing and the million dollars we got from the governor is laying the groundwork to really fix the flooding problems in the city. Then segue into public housing real quick. You know, I was the first mayor to go in there and really try to turn it around because a lot of people said it's a federal government; it's not our problem. I'll, let me, I'll interrupt you there. That's we, um, that's not bullshit either. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, you were you were, you know, you were. I mean, it was yeah. public housing was an, uh, a place to go when you're running for election. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's, to, to, to show, to but that's show a some lot of the leadership. And, they said, look, we'll put people on the board that are going to help us out politically. And then if anything went wrong, it's, well, look who I put on there and you can go to them with your problems. So I went up to HUD in D.C. and the first mayor to go up there, I said, look, we have to do this differently. And I've been helping them out, one, not charging them for the police they should be paying us. Built a new basketball court in Newtown 20. I worked with Comcast. It's the first time in the state of Maryland they're doing free and reduced Internet. For their residents, it's like nine ninety nine a month. And that's huge in the digital divide because most of the jobs are online, kids learning sure. and everything else. We've gone in there with jobs program. I'll highlight one we did with Maryland Live. I was down at McGarvey's at a fundraiser for the um, Maritime Museum, and I met the guy, and he's like, oh, we'd love to hire some of your residents. You know, we're, we're gearing up, we're staffing. To hire 20 people on the spot. Rhonda Pendel Charles and I did a job fair together. Um, so there's a number of things we're doing, and then holding them accountable. You know, every time... I meet with them and I'll say, what grants are you applying for? How are you handling your parking to get people off the street? Where's your crime plan? And I'm proud of the board of directors I put. The challenge has been, you know, just like city government, you can't do anything until you get five votes. You can't make real change until you have the majority of the board. And that kind of just recently happened. But right. I think they're making some positive changes. And I think you're going to see a much different direction. And even HUD in uh, Baltimore and D.C., they recognize that. They say... Now we're confident to help invest in you. So is it fair to say that right right now you go get hit by a, a city bus when you walk out of Middleton's here and uh, you, you pass away? The, the biggest legacy you're leaving is Jesus. the impact that you've made on public housing. Is that would that be a fair? Um, 
No, I think there's other things. I, I wouldn't put one, but I would say I think the first mayor to try to bring people together, and when you talked about the community feeling engaged, they're not used to mayors coming up on their knocking on their door and saying, what's fixed and can I fix it, instead of just, I'm here for your right. vote. Right, right. And I will say that you did also uh, thwarted the uh, Pastrana and the Nitro <laughs> Circus. But that was your old neighborhood. You were the president of that homeowners association, weren't you? Sure, Germantown Home. Yes, back, okay, where they, uh, where they did that. Um, you know, there's there's been an awful lot of good stuff. I mean, you, you're, you've taken some flack. You're going to take some more flack sure. on, uh, I'm going to stop Crystal Springs. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, to your credit, you've never shied away from that. Um, which is, you know, it, it is what it is. I said it. And, um, you know, yeah. and I th- probably, as you said, is that you don't necessarily realize how slow things work or how things work coming in new. And that was, you know, in hindsight, that would be a, probably a stupid thing to say in a campaign that I'm going to stop this development well, and but, tracks. But. And, and you know what? I'll give you a, this is a good time to kind of uh, kind of talk about it a little bit because I was looking at the new and I will, we both live along Forest Drive mm-hmm. and I was opposed to it selfishly because of traffic. Sure. You know, you know, the environment. I think uh, the, the solutions they came up with were, were adequate for what. And I consider myself an environmentalist, mm-hmm. and I felt that uh, also it was used as a red herring for for a lot of the arguments that whenever someone has a problem with development, all of a sudden it comes down to environment. Um, but what they and I think you're in a tough position because the, there are some people who are very vocal in their opposition, no matter what, who said no matter what's built there, we're going to be opposed to it. And I believe in compromise, um, but. You're kind of stuck uh, in that position because you know you, you campaigned on stopping it. But what they came up with, in my opinion, is very reasonable. Is that they took the mixed use out, and it's just uh, the assisted living, and it's just um, uh, I, th- I think it was it was the high density um, uh, or the uh, the. Well, I guess it's high density housing. Yeah. yeah, they took the rest. So, out. To, to my point, if, if I'm in charge, which would never happen on any level for anything, but I'm like, you know what? Fine. You know, I think that the good battle was battle was fought. The environmental concerns are taken care of. The traffic, to an extent, are taken care of. Um, you know, the schools are are now taken care of. So the big three are now eliminated. So if people are saying, well, but this is what he campaigned on. Is it fair to say, well, you know, I got to be reasonable, and and you know, now that they've reduced it, I can improve this, and then I can, and it's also a benefit to the city because now we got the pilot fees that are be coming in. Well, you know, so is this where you pivot and you say, I'm not, I'm not backtracking and I'm not flip flopping, but we have gotten the best deal that we possibly can. So yeah, on that, just hit it from the beginning because some people may not know about Crystal Spring. I was talking about somebody the other day because it comes up in the news, but. Basically, it was a mega mixed-use development that was going to be on Forest Drive that would have basically shut a lot of the city down. I mean, you were talking about commercial development the size of the Harbor Center, like 150 townhouses, the senior component, and in a spa daycare. So people said schools are going to overcrowd it, too much traffic, cutting down too many trees. And so I said I'm going to stop it. Just like I did with the thing right next door on 110 Compromise Street, you know, I did. I stopped that plan. I think what wasn't clear was, you know, is something going to go there? So use 110 Compromise Street for a second. I said, I'm going to stop that door dam plan, which I know you like. The day I got elected, they pulled out. Does that mean that nothing's ever going to get built? No. Quite the opposite. I make sure they have a first class facility there. So on Crystal Spring, if you look at it, all of the townhouses are taken out the inn, the spa, the commercial, the West Marine, the grocery store. Now you're just looking at a senior facility. I think 99% of people in the city would say, that's a good thing. That's something we want. The challenge for me is you have to moderate between, look, there's people that want it and are upset the original one's not going in. There's people that are against it no matter what, and there's the people in the middle. So I had someone come up to me the other day and said exactly what you said almost word for word. They said, if anything is built there, you broke your word and you lied. Right. And I said, I'm going to stop Crystal Spring. And you know what? Crystal Spring is dead. It's basically been killed. They Changed up. the name? Yeah, they, they, <laughs> I think they are. So, they, technically, you stopped it. Yeah. It's not, no, 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 but, but not just the name change because I don't want people to think that, but they cut ties with the developer. So Crystal Spring was a plan encompassing everything. That's gone away. And now there's this new, um, I think it's Providence, the village of Providence Point, is just a senior component. The Crystal Spring plan. Which is the Lutheran. Yeah, dead. Now it's just that. But going back to that point, someone said, if you put up one house, you're a liar and you broke your word. And I said, well, let me ask you, you think on 170 acres of private property, you can't put up one house? And they said, yes. You have the right as mayor and you can just stop them. And there's two things. One, they don't know the role of mayor, but two, that's unrealistic. So you can't put right. up a house. And I never campaigned and said that. So it's kind of, there's a lot of people that are going to say that no matter what. But for the plan, you know, I haven't seen the final plan. And I'm concerned that 
what's going to happen with the other parcel. They have to do a master plan for the whole property, but I've been unwavering. I've never changed, but I'm going to do you know what's in the best interest of the city. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for joining us here. And um, I'm just going to get the check here. And if you guys could just take care of that. We'll yeah. uh, but in the meantime, uh, Mr. Mayor, you can find us on Facebook. Did you know that? Um, on our Facebook page and on our group, we have the Maryland Crabs. Or, Mr. Mayor, you could tweet us at MD Crabs Podcast. You can find us there. Or John at Idanapolis and me at Tim Hamilton 47. Uh, you can email and us. And if anyone wants the mayor's cell phone number and his home phone number, <laughs> he prefers calls between 2 a.m. and 3 yeah. <laughs> three. Email us info at the You can find us at the uh, on the web, and you can go to iTunes where you can subscribe to our podcast. You can go to Google Play, give us a bunch of ratings, bits of a bunch of super great ratings. The mayor is going to make it Maryland Crabs Day pretty soon here. I'm pretty sure. Let's right. make that proclamation. Big, yeah. big key to the city. I've always wanted one of those. Yeah. But in the meantime, Mr. Mayor, thank you very much for coming on on board, and we're going to be talking to you again in a couple weeks about candidate panel ladies. Hey, question question for you. If people, what's the best way for somebody that has a concern about the city or about something to get in touch with you? Is it through your email? Is that the best way or to call the office? Uh, the best way, mayor.annapolis.gov, or they can call the office, okay. 410-263-7997. Or just give them your spokesperson's personal yeah. address or something um, like that. And they just you know, go to her house. Time and... we have, but I will say probably the most interesting thing is mayor is the way people communicate. So if you think about it, it used to be you would just call the office or write a letter. But now we have so many people send us messages on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter with constituent requests. And I go back to one I had early on with snow. People would just take photos of their driveway and say, Ms. <laughs> Mayor Panelitis is not done. There's a dead deer in the middle right. of the street. Are you going to get the dead deer? It's still here. <laughs> then everyone retweets it to be funny. And I'm like, ah, oh. it's such a challenge. So, yes, email and phone's the best. But we also accept that there are any other media as well. I will, and, and I will say that the mayor is very responsible. I know uh, the gadfly Stephen Kahn over in Eastport. Mm-hmm. I know he's had a couple issues that I know that he's he's called and squawked about, and they've uh, been taken care of. Sidewalk repairs, I think, mostly was what it was. But thank you very much. It was wonderful to talk to you, and we will talk with you again in just a few weeks. Yep. Great. Thank you so much. This has been the Maryland Crabs Podcast with Tim Hamilton and John Fernay. Sure to follow them in all the regular places, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and online at themarylandcrabs.com. Take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Now, get the hell out of my kitchen. Seriously, go! You're still here? It's over. Go home. <laughs>